Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. She was the first woman on the Wyoming Supreme Court. Now, she's the Chief Justice. Next on Wyoming Chronicle. Earlier this year, lawyers who argued before the U.S. 10th Circuit Court of Appeals met in Colorado Springs, and their honored guests were Supreme Court Justices Sonia Sotomayor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It's only a generation since the first woman was appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor, in 1981, and already the court is tilting close to gender balance. In Wyoming, things have moved a little slower. The first woman on the Wyoming Supreme Court, Marilyn Kite, was sworn in only in the year 2000. And now, this July, she has become Chief Justice of the Court. So, perhaps the Equality State is finally catching up to its name, at least on the bench. Last year, our colleague Margaret Benson talked to Justice Kite about her Wyoming upbringing, her career as a lawyer, and what it felt like to break into the Boys Club of the Wyoming Supreme Court. The Honorable Marilyn Kite, <laughs> Wyoming's first Supreme Court Justice, our own Sandra Day O'Connor. Oh. How do you fit into the fabric of Wyoming history, Marilyn? Well, that's a large question. I am certainly uh, do not compare myself to Sandra Day O'Connor, who is a wonderful hero of a lot of uh, people, not just women judges and women lawyers. But um, I, I think in, because I am the first woman to serve on the Supreme Court, it, it is a significant moment in Wyoming's history, and it took longer than it probably should have, but um, and there, as a lot of people who are in the profession know, it, it, there really weren't a lot of women practicing law uh -huh. um, in the time I went to law school, and there just weren't a lot of women to be considered to be a judge, and so it's a it's just a, a happenstance of history, a happy one for me. Absolutely. So when you think of yourself as a Wyoming icon, <laughs> which no. you certainly are now, <laughs> how do you think about Esther? What Esther? Who was the first uh, the oh, justice of peace? It was, uh, Esther Hobart. it was Esther Hobart, yeah. right? And then the first Wyoming governor as well, Taylor, Taylor Ross. Yeah. Well, you know, Wyoming has a lot of firsts, and it's an interesting. I don't know if you're familiar with the Wyoming Women's History Museum in Laramie, but they've done a wonderful job of highlighting all of the women firsts. I mean, we had the one first woman juror, mm -hmm. the first woman to vote, the first woman bailiff, uh, let alone the first woman judge. And, and then we went a long time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's just a kind of a fact of society. There weren't a, a lot of women working in the profession. Yeah, particularly for Wyoming. So, so you do say it, it was a long time, and it seems like a long time before appointed. So um, your colleagues describe you as extremely bright. Justice Hill talks about you as being full of life oh, yeah, that's nice. and uh, very discerning. And he was in law school with you and also an undergraduate, so you were always very prepared. So with all those wonderful things that people have said about you, why do you think you were appointed as the first female judge for Wyoming in the Wyoming Supreme Court? Well, I, um, I, w I was lucky enough to have a career that started actually in, in the Capitol here at the Attorney General's office and, and as a, a it is with a lot of people. Life is a question of timing and luck and events. And for me, I started out here as an environmental lawyer uh, when there weren't any. And, and it was so written that you were Wyoming's first environmental lawyer. Well, that's Why are because you called it, that? we had no environmental laws before I got out of uh, uh, law school. It really mm -hmm. was a timing thing. Mm -hmm. And Judge Bremer was the attorney general at that time and hired me. And that happened to be the opening. It was total luck. Mm -hmm. But I went from that to a, a, a law practice with Holland and Hart that allowed me to kind of specialize and do a lot of fun things over my legal career. And it truly was at the time I was ready for a change and the time I was, that I had enough experience to serve on the court, there was an opening. And um, I was just lucky that I was there and available at the time there was an opening. And, you know, uh, Governor Geringer is the one that appointed me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm certain he did not appoint me because I was a woman. I'm hopeful he appointed me because I had uh, the experience at the time and, and uh, in, in his judgment was the best candidate. Well, you had a stellar career with Holland and Hart. You were a partner. Were you their first female partner in that law practice? No, I was the third, I think it was. Mm -hmm. There were two women before me who were good friends. Um, 
but uh, I was lucky to be particularly with that firm simply because they emphasized diversity and always have, and uh, it was simply never an issue. Uh, it was if you did the work and and uh, and could qualify and do the what the clients wanted. That's how you were considered. Was it difficult for you to make the decision to leave such a lucrative and prestigious law practice to to come into public service? It w yeah, I think it was difficult to leave the people that I worked mm -hmm. with, and I enjoyed the substance of the of the work a lot. Um, and I had never really thought about being a judge, so it was it was a, a decision that didn't come that I didn't plan ahead for. Mm -hmm. uh, I was encouraged a lot by my brother, who was a district judge. Yeah, your brother is in Rollins, in correct? Rollins, Ken that's Stebner. right. And uh, and by my husband Skip Jacobson, who is a lawyer and thought that it was a good opportunity for me and that I ought to give it a try. The appointment of judges has been in the press lately a lot, with the governor appointing his wife Nancy Friedenthal for the federal position. Um, I'd like your, your assessment of that and also tell us how Wyoming Supreme Court justices are appointed and what you think about that process as well. Well, our, our process is very different from the federal So the governor process. does not appoint. The governor appoints, but, but in Wyoming, and, I, and I, I like to brag about our system and I think we should be proud mm -hmm. of it, it's, a, it's called a merit selection system, a judicial nominating commission picks three candidates that the governor can pick from. Mm -hmm. And that commission's made up of Wyoming, three Wyoming citizens, and uh, are those appointed positions as well? Or appointed elected? by the governor, mm -hmm. and three lawyers who are elected by the bar, and they serve, I think, three-year terms. But they really do look at applications. And I had a chance of serving on that commission before I was a judge, and and they really try to get the best person possible, right. best three people possible. I've heard many uh, governors say it's the one of the most fun things they do because they know they're not going to make a mistake. They're going to pick. A, someone who's well qualified and someone who was chosen outside of the political process. How often does it happen that a Wyoming Supreme Court judge is appointed? Because they're lifetime appointments, aren't they? No, they're not lifetime mm -hmm. appointments. Um, they are at this point in time. They are uh, there's a mandatory retirement. It's age 70. Well, that seems awfully um, young. Well, and the, actually, the legislature is considering uh, eliminating that requirement, but it is a constitutional requirement, so it'll mm -hmm. have to go through that process. Uh, so if someone retires and there's an opening, or someone leaves for another reason, there's an opening. But they there aren't openings often, um, and it was just lucky that one came about about the time I was ready to make a change. I was just recently in Texas, and I was surprised to see how many signs there were for judges campaigning for their position. So Wyoming doesn't campaign. So what's the difference between Wyoming system and those states, and why do you think Wyoming's is more positive? Right well, the Wyoming system does have, uh, once we're appointed, we have to run for what's called retention, and right. the voters can say, kick them out, we don't want them anymore, or retain this person in the judgeship. So the voters get to speak in that context. But there's no partisan election, and if you saw it, you know how distasteful it is to it see. Well, it seemed that way. Yeah. Well, people have to raise money, just like they're raising money for federal and uh, congressional positions, and people get lobbied for it. And then you go into a courtroom and expect to have a level playing field, and it, it uh, certainly is, gives the appearance of problems. And Wyoming's very lucky that back in the early '70s, uh, Stan Lowe from Casper, mm -hmm. who uh, came came to us with the idea, or came to Wyoming with the idea of this change, and we adopted it constitutionally. So it's a system, and at least in my view, we really need to protect. Okay. So there's four other Supreme Court justices, and they are obviously all men. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> so what, how do you get along? How do you work with them? Do you guys, are you in your silos, in your own cocoons? Uh, do you have a lot of discussion about your opinions, or how do you work with those other Well, uh, first of all, many of them are, uh, were good friends of mine before I was right. on the court. Yeah, so a lifetime. Justice Bill, Hill. Yeah, Justice Hill and I have been friends since sophomores in high school, as a when, matter of fact. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the other uh, justices, we just work very well collegially together. It is kind of a solitary job. Uh, you come up with your own positions on cases and then you discuss them jointly. But once, uh, once the case is argued in front of us, we sit down and talk about it. A lot of times something will come up once you're writing an opinion and we'll have additional conferences. So it's very collegial from that standpoint. Okay, and are those conversations done in private? Do you persuade each other? Or is that something that press attends to? Or how are those conversations? Well, going? they're definitely done in private and that's mm -hmm. by statute. And, okay. and uh, it, there, there is, it's just a combination of, of uh, I, I'm sure your personal style has some impact, but more it's, you know, who's got, who's looking at the case, who, what does the law say, can you find the law that supports your position sufficiently to 
to persuade uh, one of your colleagues to come your 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 way. Mm -hmm. Most of our opinions, I've never really looked at the statistics, but I'm sure the large percentage of them are, are a consensus of five, uh, all of uh, all five of us agreeing. Coming together for life right. minds. Um, now I know before I really started to look at it, I really didn't know how much how the Supreme Court fit into the other courts in the state of Wyoming. Just very briefly, uh, show me, tell me the syntax. How do the Supreme Court fit in with the other justice systems in the state of Wyoming? Well, the Wyoming Supreme Court's the court of last resort. Every case goes either through the circuit court or the district courts, can be appealed from a circuit court to a district court, and then directly to us. But we can, we hear appeals any case that's ultimately appealed in the state of Wyoming comes to us and we are the court of last resort. So you're the last uh, line, mm -hmm. and so how do those ca the cases come before you? Do you sit in front of a jury or do the attorneys come and speak to you or how are those, no. how, does that, how does it work? Because we're an appellate court, we just look at the record that was made in the trial court or okay. made below and it's, it's on paper and there are lawyers file briefs on both sides and tell us what the law is and whether or not they think there was error at the lower court level. Mm -hmm. We have no witnesses or exhibits and introduced to the Supreme Court. We're limited to that record, but it's a public process. Oh, so the public can attend. public can come in and we invite them in. We have a beautiful new Supreme Court facility that can accommodate them and they, unless it's a confidential matter which involves usually child custody or, sure. or juvenile issues, they're all open to the public. Now, how are the opinions handed down, and what are the types of opinions that are handed down? We um, we can consider everything from dog bites to death <laughs> penalties. We I like to say um, uh -huh. so. It just depends on the nature of the case, but they are always issued in writing. Okay. In fact, I'm pretty sure that that might be even constitutional, but it's certainly statutory that we issue written opinions. Um, one of us is assigned the job of writing the the opinion, and then it's circulated to the other four, and you agree or disagree with the opinion. If you disagree, you write a dissent. And so when the opinion is issued, it's it's both the concur the majority opinion as well as any concurring or dissenting opinions that okay. might become with it. And do you have people assist in writing those, clerks or that sort of thing, or do you, is it all from you? Well, the, it, it, the justices obviously are responsible ultimately for the opinion. All of us have two law clerks who are indispensable in mm -hmm. terms of going through the record and reading the law and assisting in the drafting of the opinion. So it's a, a collaborative effort and probably different for every justice. Right, right. Um, so um, the justice, the clerks are a part of that and then you, you discuss the cases together and you hand down opinions. How do those opinions become public? How does the public access or be able to read those decisions that you make? Well, it's much more public now than it used to be. It used mm -hmm. to be our clerk would put them out on the bench in, in, uh, at the clerk's office and people would have to come by and pick them up and she would call the parties obviously that are that are participating but now it's all online and uh, you can access it on our website as the opin opinions are issued and then ultimately of course they're published in the West reporters and anybody can access those at the library. So on a daily basis anything that the court is hearing the public can find out what you're talking about. You can story. find out our schedule as what we're going to hear and when the cases are going to be scheduled to be argued mm -hmm. and when opinions are issued. Okay so you were appointed in June of 2000 mm -hmm. so your 10th anniversary is coming up. Wow. Uh, in your career on sitting on the bench what are some of the opinions that you've participated in that you think have impacted the most individual people in the state of Wyoming? Well, of course, we have uh, we have criminal cases, we have big c commercial cases, we have all kinds of cases. But I, I think it would be fair to say, in terms of uh, impacting the most people, the school finance sure. litigation had that impact. Okay, tell me a little background about that and how that decision was handed down. Well, it's a it's an issue of you know Wyoming funds uh, did fund a lot of its schools through property taxes, and of course, every county has different wealth in terms of property taxes and so it created an unequal situation where children in one part of the state didn't receive the same quality as children in other parts of the state. For over 30 years this issue had been struggled with in the court and and in the legislature kind of a back and forth situation and then in in uh, the decade of the of the 2000s two cases were came before us where the state and the legislature did a tremendous amount of work, really revamped our whole education system. Right. And uh, in an effort to comply with our court's, uh, the Constitution's requirement, as articulated by our court, that it be equal. You were a little bit on the hot seat in that issue. Well, we all little, were. You were wide, <laughs> way out in front on well, that. Well, we, we were all on the hot seat, but I did have the, the responsibility of, of authoring two of those opinions, and it was an awesome responsibility. Sure. It's, it's a case that, uh, people have invested their lives in experts and, and, and uh, people in the school systems. So it was a challenge. I think we 
did the best we could and, and went through the record to determine, you know, whether the, and actually in both cases there were lots and lots of issues, but the, it went in front of the district court here in, in Cheyenne first, and, and for the most part we affirmed what he did. Did you receive any uh, critical press during that time, or do Supreme Court judges receive critical <laughs> press? Are you, you know, lofty and above that sort of thing, or well, do you get criticized in the public for some uh, of you know, There's issues? no question we received criticism. I think that most of the criticism came from the legislature, thinking that we were invading into their province and that there's, it should, the powers of the, of the branches of government should be separated. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the most part the press was, was relatively supportive of what we did. The public, you know, it splits based upon they're the haves and the haves not. The ones who get, like right. it, the ones who get, get taken, don't. So like I, I have not heard anybody, and it would be interesting, frankly, to hear them really look at the substance of the opinion and say, you know, was the, an, was the analysis right? Was the research right? I, I have not seen that, and I'm, I'm sure it's getting done out there somewhere. I always would tell people when they commented, read the opinion. Sure, absolutely. Were you concerned about being retained after that decision was made? Well, it happened pretty quickly after I got on the court and yeah, you're always thinking about sure. that, 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 that you want to make sure. It's, it's difficult and I used to say when I first got on the court I thought this would be a great job because I had a six-year-old and a <laughs> trial lawyer and I'd sure. finally get the last word <laughs> as a husband. But um, the truth is you don't get the last word so if they uh. criticize you, you just, you know, have to realize that's part of the job and, right. and some people have different opinions. What's the most controversial decision you ever had to make? Well, I, it's, again, I think it's clearly was the school finance case. Okay. Um, there have been other opinions that affect, you know, our particular industry, um, uh, mineral tax cases or something like that that have been controversial, but I think if you had a scale, I'm sure that one would be mm -hmm. on top. You make such weighty decisions and ones that impact people for years and years and years and change law mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So what resources do you draw on for that kind of discernment? Is it some Maryland Kite wisdom too or how do you make those decisions? Well, it's, it's certainly not personal wisdom of any of the five of us. I mean, our job is to separate our, our personal feelings and our personal prejudices from the facts and the law of the case. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're trained in law school to study the law and to try to apply it to the factual situation. And there are cases where it's very close and, sure. and you make your best judgment um, in, an, in an effort to be honest to your job, which is interpretation of the law, not creation of it. Right. People are very sensitive about that sure. issue uh, today and, and cre criticizing activist judges. And I, I, I like to joke that, speaking of Sandra Day O'Connor, she indicated that it's you can't get up and go to work anymore without being called an activist judge. Right, right, because you're making decisions. Because you're making that a decision. Takes people in different directions. Right, yeah, absolutely for sure. Um, you're a Wyoming girl. Yes, a Wyoming I am. native. Tell us a little bit about your family and your family legacy in Wyoming. Well, I both sides of my family uh, came here as immigrants. One, my mother's family, to the. Pinedale Daniel area and my father's family to Hannah and uh, I have a very uh, emotional tie to the state without question. Those folks really uh, lived the life of the pioneer. Uh, my grandmother and Hannah ran the hotel and fed the miners and lived through the, the mine explosions and my mother's uh, mother was you know homesteading in the tough times outside of you know 30 miles outside of Pinedale. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I'm proud of that legacy. I'm, I'm uh, proud of the, what this state has offered to its people and to me. And um, I have a very strong connection to the, to the place. What do you say to other women who want to go into the legal profession or maybe they aspire to be like Marilyn Kite someday <laughs> and be on the Wyoming Supreme? What advice do you have for them? Well, you know, the interesting thing is that it, women are almost more than 50% of law school classes now. So there's a tremendous shift that's incurred during the, my three-year uh, career. And I think women are particularly well-suited to the law. I think they're, they can be intuitive um, and analytical and um, it, it, their, their mindset of trying to come up with a solution and a resolution is, is something we need in Absolutely. the law. So, you know, my advice to them is get as good of an education as you can, mm -hmm. be as well prepared as you can, and be expected to be uh, as, as well prepared and as effective as your male counterpart, and you'll be fine. Absolutely. Is there something particularly intriguing that you're working on right now that you can talk about that during this current legislative se session that a case that's coming down that is particularly challenging for you? Well, I can't really talk about cases that are pending. Mm -hmm. um, we have a number of, of uh, significant criminal cases that we're working hard on. There, are the, there used to be a lot of uh, mineral taxation cases that we struggled with, and they're difficult. But the legislature has done a lot to 
to answer the questions that existed in that area, so there's not as many of those kinds of cases. Uh, we have some major commercial cases that are tough and that we're, that we're getting ready to circulate. Um, but there aren't any really, I, that I can think of right now, any, any issues that, that are affecting the legislature that, that would also affect us. We, we have just initiated an access to justice campaign that has really come from the Bar Association and the, uh, the Board of Judicial Policy, and it's, it's very exciting. It's, I hate to talk yeah. about it too much because it's not what through the entail? legislature. What does that entail? Well, it's going to provide, hopefully, some funding through the increase in, of, in filing fees to provide legal services for the, for the indigent, for the, for the poor. Mm -hmm. And um, it's getting well received, not passed yet, but if it passes, uh, I think there's a real commitment on the part of our court as well as the Wyoming judiciary to try to make our judicial system more uh, effective and more accessible to people who need it. Now I know the Wyoming Supreme Court judge in the past, the justice, the all of you together have traveled to different parts of the state mm -hmm. to have your hearings. Do you still do that? We do that. We, we have heard a lot of cases in schools, in high schools around the state, and it's a wonderful experience mm -hmm. for us and for the students. Absolutely. And we do that when we're invited into a school, um, and then we go to the classes and uh, ex talk to them about the process. It's it's a it's a very important thing to do, and I often tell the students that when we've done that and had one of those days, they probably know a lot more about the court system than their parents Absolutely. do. Absolutely, <laughs> there's no doubt about that at all. Are there any decisions that you have to hand down that are personally the hardest for you? Oh, I think the hardest for all of us probably, or one of the hardest, is child things that involve child custody Certainly. Uh, and child welfare. Um, it's it's not a good. Uh, mechanism for our society to put uh, the hands of the the fate of children in the hands of, of judges but that's the only mm -hmm. way we have to resolve it and uh, you know that it's a uh, agonizing process for the families and I think that's probably the hardest All right. and what legacy do you want to leave when your time has come to retire and hopefully it won't be 70 <laughs> what <laughs> yeah. legacy do you want to leave behind as a Wyoming Supreme Court justice oh I don't know I am um, I guess I would just hope that I, I, when my opinions and my work is looked at in total, that I was, I was seen as being fair and unbiased and um, hopefully trying to apply the law in, a, in an appropriate way. Um, there are, it, it, this job does give you a wonderful opportunity to speak out on issues that are important and I hope to do that as, as I proceed. Tell me one fun thing in closing, one fun thing that, that happened because you're the only female on the Supreme Court. <laughs> something that when you're working with uh, the other men on the court, tell me something that's happened that maybe was surprising for well, you. I don't, I don't know if I should do this on a program like yeah. this, but the, the, it, it, it necessarily hasn't happened to me. I'm going to tell you that story. Okay. Okay. <laughs> my, my brother used to travel in, in a lot of the different venues, and um, Nancy Guthrie, who's the district judge in Jackson said she could always tell when he'd been in the chambers because the lid was up. That, oh, <laughs> that is telling for so sure. That's telling. that's telling for sure. <laughs> but you know, for the most part, um, we just joke around about it, and it's a it's a collegial uh, situation. So it really hasn't hasn't affected me, I don't think, one way or the okay. other. And what do you see for the future of other women being on the Wyoming Supreme Court? Well, I, I'm constantly encouraging women to, to consider the judiciary and to think about it in their career mm -hmm. and to encourage the Judicial Nominating Commission to encourage women. Mm -hmm. um, when I served on that commission, sadly, there were a lot of openings where we had no women applicants. Mm -hmm. And so the only future there is for women on the Wyoming Supreme Court is to get good, strong lawyers, women lawyers, to think about it and to kind of look, uh, uh, direct their career in that in that way. Yeah. And do you personally have any influence in terms of, well you're on the, you're on the selection committee right now, correct? No, I, I served before I became on the, uh, b before I came on the court. Mm -hmm. the, the Chief Justice sits as an ex officio member, not a voting member of the commission, so no, we have no influence other than sometimes we are asked to write recommendations because the lawyers have to have three judges and so if a, a person we have experience with a person then we will write a recommendation but but in terms of the selection process uh, our courts not involved okay and what future influence do you hope to have as an individual on the on the laws and legislation of Wyoming well I'm particularly f uh, enthused about this whole access to justice process okay. I think we can do a better job at delivering justice in a more cost-effective way in a more efficient way and and yet uh, provide people who do not have a lot of resources an opportunity to enjoy the justice for all that we that we talk about in our constitution. Okay. Well, anything else that you want to add before we say? It's then? just been a real pleasure okay. to, right. to visit with you, Margaret, right. and I appreciate you asking me to participate. Okay. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thank you for visiting with us, Miller. You bet. Okay. 
Just as Kite has earned her position on the court, let's hope that some of the other deserving women lawyers out there get a chance too. After all, there are now three women on the U.S. Supreme Court. Next week, Wyoming Chronicle begins its new season. The heart of it will be the sort of in-depth interview you've watched throughout our first year, but now there's gonna be more. We're gonna include short features on topics and people all over the state, from Kenny Saylor's, the legendary UW basketball great, to burgeoning farmer's markets around the state. You'll hear musical numbers from live performances on our music shows and previews of programs like a documentary on Legend Rock, the ancient petroglyph site north of Thermopolis. And every week, we'll set our videographers loose to bring you back some of Wyoming's extraordinary landscapes. So tune in. It's your television magazine, Wyoming Chronicle, right here on Wyoming PBS. The Wyoming Chronicle doesn't end when this half hour does. It continues on our website, wyomingpbs.org, where with your help, we'll begin an ongoing dialogue around the topics we discuss on the air. Share your experiences and tell us what you think. And while you're at it, throw some ideas at us for future topics and guests. <laughs>